Welcome everybody. This is the first tutorial to introduce you to the technology we use uh, during uh, the last lesson of the summer school uh, about healthcare care organized by OpenDot. I'm uh, Enrico Bassi, uh, coordinator of the lab uh, and also very interested in this kind of topics so I'm very happy to see that so many people are actually sharing our own uh, and the same uh, point of view on why designers should care about this uh, kind of things. So the last lesson is actually about uh, how to make your own training kit or, uh, or how a designer can design a training kit for a hospital, for doctor, for nurses. So there's already a wide range of uh, training kits, of course. And uh, in some cases, it's important to simulate uh, the consistency. In some cases, it's important to simulate uh, uh, the blood flow. So the, uh, in some cases, it's just a matter of geometry. Uh, so the, the range is very wide that we can't focus on everything. Um, there are two very important things that uh, we um, will probably use in, in more than one cases, being something you don't do uh, once, but you do more than once, of course, because you want to train more than once. Um, it's important to understand how to replicate the object. So this brings us to the topic of uh, um, silicon rubbers, and how to design a mold. Uh, this topic will be split in two different parts, uh, one with the practical aspects, uh, so the material and how to pour the material in a mold, uh, how to cast something uh, and how to demold it and so on, and the other one a bit more uh, on what silicon rubber is. It's a very wide set of materials, so we have to simplify a bit, uh, but I hope you will find this helpful. So, as we were saying, uh, uh, this is the last lesson uh, with a specific focus on the training kit. So, training kits uh, exist, and as, as I said, a wide variety of different uh, uh, things. Um, I think that it's fascinating to see how the same kind of skills could actually be used in, in very different cases. So our objective is mainly to understand the basic techniques behind how to make uh, a replica of something and eventually how to cast um, silicon rubber inside a mold to get the object out of silicon rubber. The positive thing in that case is that we don't get something rigid, but it's actually uh, soft and it can simulate, as I said, a wide range of materials. So. This tutorial will focus on these topics, um, a bit of, let's say, the basics, and then we'll have a second part of the tutorial in which we go through a very simple, basic example, just to grasp the problems and what kind of things uh, could be done in which way. So silicon rubber is actually, uh, as I said, a name that describes a range of things. Uh, and we can start to categorize the things in different ways. The first important category is between liquid silicon rubbers and dense, uh, mm, let's say, uh, paddy silicon rubbers. So things that has a consistency that can be uh, mixed together, sim similar to uh, Play-Doh, uh, and after you mix the things together, you get uh, a sort of chewing gum that can that will be uh, rubbery in a few minutes. So you can take this material and push it on top of the object to actually get the replica. In the case of the liquid one, of course, we're not talking about watery materials. It's still a bit dense, but they have a capability of uh, flow into every single small crack to copy the details. Um, and that allows us to get replicas that are perfect of the object we put in. This could be uh, useful, of course, or uh, not that useful if uh, we are replicating defects. We'll see uh, what they mean about that. So um, usually the putty materials um, are a bit less used. They are a bit more expensive, uh, and usually they're very fast. So we'll see what... Uh, pot and demold times means, but basically they get uh, rubber and, you know, not deformable anymore very quickly. 
So to get good details, it's better to use liquid parts, and it's also difficult to make big objects out of that. Uh, partially, it's also a matter of costs. Usually, they are a bit more expensive, but that's not the main topic here. So, second uh, important classification in silicons is the difference between uh, polycondensation and polyadviction. Uh, it seems to be a bit technical, but the point that we have to remember is just that in one case we create a sort of irregular uh, map, and in the other one we get a more regular one. Um, polycondensation is usually cheaper and easier to use, so if you don't have specific requirements uh, or you have to do very peculiar things, usually it's the easier one to go with, uh, but is less precise, so you get a uh, um, deformation, a, a stretch in the final shape, but it's around 1%. Polyaddiction, on the other hand, um, have a set of positive things, usually is the one used for food, is the one used for uh, medical applications, and uh, it, it's also more precise. It's usually a bit more costly, but that's not always the case. Now, uh, the ratio that you see here, 95-5 and 50-50, is not always the same. There are polyaddiction uh, uh, silicon that goes 90-10, um, but in general, uh, it's, it's more common to have 50-50 and 90-10 or 95-5. What's that supposed to mean? Well, when we mix the materials to start the reaction, uh, in average, it's easier having two components to mix them together in equal amounts. Um, it's written on the silicon if equals means same volume or it means uh, same weight. And, and that could change because the density of the two components is not always the same. So one of the first very common mistakes is to mix things, um, weight in them while you had to check the volume or vice versa. The other thing in 50-50, small mistakes are not uh, usually a big problem, but uh, in 95.5, uh, if you mix 1% uh, more catalyzer or 1% less catalyzer, that could change the time of the reactions. In particular, if the reaction is faster, uh, you might have not enough time to do the entire process before getting uh, to a state in which uh, the silicon rubber is not good anymore. It's, it's, it can't be used anymore. Last point, usually the polycondensation is less sensitive to contamination. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, very often we use uh, like um, modeling uh, dough uh, to cover some details or to hold the object in place. Some of those can have uh, like um, um, chemicals inside that can compromise the chemical reaction in, in, in the polyaddiction resins, while usually polycondensation is more stable and, again, easier to use. Uh, you have some links with descriptions both um, from a, a medical silicon and another one used um, for different objectives, but the best way is to try and, and see uh, with experience the feeling that you have. Now, the features of the silicon rubber that helps us to understand and use it properly uh, are basically this one. and It's important to go through them uh, a bit carefully. Usually, these are also the information that you get on the label of, of the resin. So, uh, check them. It's very important to don't make mistakes. First of all, the mix ratio. Uh, the silicon rubbers are B components, so you have two different things that you have to mix together to start the, uh, the, the process that will make it into a rubber. The ratio is very important, as we were saying. In uh, this case, for instance, it's written mix ratio by volume, uh, 1A, 1B. It means that I will take 
two plastic containers, take the same amount of the two different resins and mix them together in volume. So I don't need, for instance, a scale. I, I might need, um, you know, just a couple of plastic uh, cups or glasses and, and that would be it. The density, um, so the specific uh, gravity is described here or, or weight, um, it's useful when uh, we are not talking about volumes, but we are talking about uh, uh, weight. So maybe uh, you don't have a precise scale and you need to do some transformations. It's also useful because if you mix things in weight, we'll see to have an idea of the amount of resin that you have to, uh, of the amount of silicon, sorry, that you have to mix it's very good to um, have this reference. So you check the weight and it's easier to check on the volume and you know that that amount is going to be enough. Pot life is very important. So pot life is basically um, how much time you have to deal with the silicon in its uh, liquid form or better in a form that it's liquid enough to actually work as a mold. So to actually be casted inside a shape and copy every detail. After this amount of time, it becomes too rubbery to flow into the details and you might end up losing some of these details. So what's better, long pot life or short pot life? Well, it depends. It depends what you want to do. If you have to make a lot of replicas, one after the other, then probably it's better to have a short pot uh, pot life. No, pot life is also related to the cure time, if it's the second one we'll see. Um, and that means the, the total amount of time it takes before I can take out my silicon parts. On the other hand, if you want a more uh, detailed mold, if you want something more precise, and in particular if you want to degas the silicon, it's an important process to take away the air bubbles that could create defects, but in that case it's better to have a long pot life. Um, it gives more time for the vacuum if you use a vacuum chamber or, or just, you know, gravity to let the air flow to the top, keeping the resin very liquid. Of course that means it's going to take longer. We'll see in, uh, in the course the two different ways of actually using silicon rubber. One is to make a mold to cast something rigid, like plaster, uh, clay, or resins, uh, or epoxy resins, and other things. And the other way is to actually use the silicon to be casted into a mold that is rigid to get flexible parts. Now, when you use the silicon to make a mold, it's better to you know, invest a bit more time and get a better result. When you use the silicon to make parts, well, in that case, time could be a critical uh, aspect of your process. And in that case, it might be better to sh choose something with a shorter uh, pot life. Second time, the cure time. So how long it takes to cure, to uh, allow the chemical reaction to happen. Well, in this case, it's usually related to the pot life. The longer the pot life, the longer the cure time. And uh, it's the amount of time you have to wait before taking out the part. So before this amount of time, you might be able to demold the part or take it out of the mold. Uh, but it's also possible that you deform uh, the silicon or that is not strong enough to um, resist when you pull and you end up ripping uh, the mold in two. Shelf life is how long you can keep it in your house before using it. Uh, so it's an amount of time in which the producer guarantee the quality of the material. Short grade, very important. So the short grade gives us an idea of how flexible the rubber is. So rubber goes from chewing gum to uh, car tires and and the range in, in between this is a, of course a pretty wide range so again 
Um, let's go into details about this a bit later, but it's important to understand which kind of uh, stiffness or hardness of, of, your, of your part you are requiring. Last point, tear strength. So, um, when you tear a piece of art, uh, there is a certain strength that you have to apply. Now, uh, same kind of silicon or similar uh, looking silicons, maybe with the same short grade, so feeling the same, might have different tear strength. So it might end up that you pull something and you uh, rip it off very easily, or, or it's very elastic, so you just stretch it, but as soon as you release it, it goes back to the original shape. This is another important aspect we'll talk about in a second. So let's start from the shore. Um, as you can see, the, this degree of uh, hardness uh, is described in different, in different uh, uh, grades, in different scales. So uh, the shore zero zero is for very soft material. This could be interesting for us because if we want to simulate uh, skin or fat, we might end up using a very soft uh, material, in particular in some cases. The average scale, uh, scale for silicon rubber, the most commonly used, is the shore A. So in shore A, um, I put here two different references. One is from one website and the other one from another one. And you see that there's a bit of uh, disagreement. It's not perfectly aligned. Um, but just to have an idea, the consistency of a chewing gum is, is very uh, close to the limit of the shore A uh, scale. Um, it's a very soft material. It seems a bit uh, like skin, and uh, it it helps if you are if we are talking about molds to demold complex objects. But we'll get into that with, in a while. Um, Twenty shore a it's closer to um, something rubbery, a rubber band, for instance. And when we move up to 30 and 50, we get to more uh, stiff and rigid materials. Again, silicon rubber can be used to make the mold or to make the parts. Now, when you make the parts, that could be very interesting in our field of applications. You make the parts and you want to replicate the consistency of some parts of the body. Now, uh, there are very few parts in our body that have uh, a, a shore grade around uh, 50 or plus, but it could be used, for instance, to uh, simulate the cartilage, um, or it could be used to simulate muscles or um, some uh, the tendons. So it could be used to simulate more stiff part, more rigid part, still flexible but less extendable, let's say so. While soft grades 10 and 20 could be used for skin uh, or fat or uh, more soft parts in the body, maybe organs. So it's important to um, have some tests and see what works better. But keep in mind that in average you can mix other materials inside the silicon rubber to change some properties, to make it more rigid, but also actually to extend uh, the pot life, for instance. Um, so when you need something specific uh, and you know that the silicon available to you are not exactly what you're looking for, keep in mind to search for the additive. So um, speak with some experts, with some resellers to figure out what's the best solution for you because the range is, is very wide. When we are talking about making a mold, so maybe we want to replicate a rigid object, so it's a piece of a bone, it's a, that's actually going to be the example I will use in the second part. In that case, um, 
the shore has a different impact. So very soft uh, silicon rubber can be flexible enough to slide out <coughs> of tiny details, for instance. This could be important if I have complex geometries. Um, if I have, uh, I don't know, the reconstruction of a vein or something very detailed and very thin, I want the, the silicon to be flexible enough to allow all the tiny pieces to slide out. If the silicon is too rigid, if the shore is too high, then uh, the risk is that when I try to demold the object, I'm going to break the object because uh, tiny details will be uh, broken by the stiffness of, of the silicon rubber. The price to pay for a very soft uh, silicon is actually the fact that it's harder to get uh, the right overall dimension. So if I have something very soft, it's easy, even if I put it in a box, if I squeeze it a bit too much or I deformed it, and the overall size of the object could change. While, of course, if I'm using a, a harder silicon, then the, the, the consistency is enough to guarantee that the shape is not going to be changed. So think also about the application you want. Tiny features or... Uh, a more correct geometry. It's not just tiny features, it's complex features as well, okay? So in some cases, when you have very articulated geometries, you need something capable of, let's say, sliding out uh, or allowing the pieces to slide out of the mold. The tear strength uh, is the last as aspect that we are interested in. Again, keep in mind that we're using silicon to, with two different objectives. So first objective is make a mold. When we make a mold, the tear strength is strongly related to the number of copies we are capable of making. Every time we demold the object, we stress a bit the material and after a while, the material would just uh, give up and, and break. So if we are not interested in making a lot of copies, then even a low uh, tear strength is good enough. But on the other hand, if we want to um, have a mold that lasts longer and is capable to replicate, to be used to uh, have more replicas, at that point we have to invest a bit more in a silicon that has a good tear strength. When we talk about using silicons to make pieces, then the tear strength is really related to uh, how it reacts to be cut, basically. I will show you some examples in the second parts, but keep in mind uh, if it's something that you need to cut easily uh, or, or, or you don't want to cut easily, you don't want to rip it off, maybe stitching on it, then this will impact uh, the tear strength of, of uh, the silicon. Um, even without understanding what the kilonewton parameter is, uh, what's important to understand is that this parameter goes from 11 to 52. So basically uh, one and five times more. So the, the range is very wide. You can have something very weak and something with, with a uh, strength of five, five times um, the original material. So um, this is one of the aspects that it's important to experiment as well. It's really something you feel when you use the material and it's not so uh, easy to imagine without uh, any references. So um, I added in the presentation two videos because it's important uh, maybe to see the process um, even in, in different approach. These videos are made manually. So um, silicon mold uh, has been used for a very long time to replicate objects in different ways, but has been used definitely uh, since before the adoption or the diffusion of uh, 3D printers. So. Here you can see the traditional process. Have a look at it. 
first of all it's amazing the level of details that this guy is capable of, of reaching and it makes you confident with the process uh, of uh, what the uh, alignment key is uh, or a runner or a vent hole and what's the problem with the bubbles um, but in general you see the entire process and that's that's very useful now you can also see how long it takes okay to go through the entire process uh, probably what you do with 3d printers ignoring the time of course to 3d print the part um, is way faster you can design all the features uh, um, in a computer using the CAD you like the most and the final result is, is easier to update and improve uh, I still think that it's a very good example on uh, all the process and you get familiar with the uh, terminology as well that is very useful a bit extra at the end of this presentation um, it, it's, it's about this your enemy in making parts out of silicon will be air bubbles <laughs> because no matter if you use the silicon to make a mold or to make a, a piece um, when you cast it even if you're careful there's always the risk to trap some air bubbles now those cavities stays as a cavity in the object and that could be a problem of course but even worse they can be an extra cavity in the mold that means that every time you cast something in a mold in which you have bubbles on the surface you'll actually have extra bumps uh, all around uh, uh, your object wherever a bubble was so professionally the best way to deal with that is to use a vacuum chamber a vacuum chamber is basically a, a big box in which you put your object take out the air bubbles explode because of the difference in pressure um, and what you get is a very clean uh, um, resin or silicon of course if you don't make a lot of these uh, silicon parts maybe making or even worse buying a, a machine like this could be not necessary but keep in mind that bubbles will be a problem for you so we'll see these aspects in the second part in the practical parts but in average uh, when you mix the silicon the liquid one of course don't whip it okay it's important to um, reduce the amount of air that we trap inside uh, the silicon then when you pour it it's good to pour it from a high distance this will make a very thin uh, film of uh, silicon and that stretches the bubbles and allows them to uh, escape more easily when you pour you usually pour in a corner of the of the mold that allows the silicon to flow from the bottom and fill the cavity um, in, in a proper way at the end it's good to shake the, the mold sometimes using uh, uh, tools that vibrate like uh, the abrasive the sandpaper machines very often we use that to shake a bit the mold uh, these vibrations helps the bubbles to flow away and of course as I said if you use a long uh, pot life uh, silicon you can pour the silicon pour it back in the original container and then pour it a second time this will stretch a layer of silicon on the surface and guarantee a better quality of the surface if the pot life is too short, this process is, is not feasible. Okay, um, this is it. The second part of uh, this tutorial will be just a simple, simple exercise that everybody can do to see um, how to replicate uh, an existing object. I started from a 3D printed part, but you can do it in other ways. It's important to see the features and the problems, and we will end up probably breaking our mold just to give you a feeling of uh, um, how resistant that, that object can be. 
So stay tuned for the second part uh, and um, see you at the course.